Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us again for our study this uh, today. Um, we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 4. As you know, if you've been following with along with us, we've been in a study of the book of Acts. And uh, today we're going to be studying the subject of, of boldness or intimidation. Or mm -hmm. intimidation and boldness, which is essentially what happens in Acts chapter 4 in the uh, in in the book in, in the, the book that we're studying now. So if you'll open your um, Bibles with me, we'll read a portion of scripture, then we'll pray and we'll get into our study today. Um, Acts chapter 4, we're going to read verses 23 to verse 31. Right? Here's what it says. And being let go, they went their own they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. These are the apostles. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, and thou hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in, in them. Who, by the mouth of thy servant David, had said, Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers had gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thine hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. Father, speak to us today as we uh, hear and listen to the Word of God. I pray that your Word would minister and speak to us in a special way and that um, we would receive boldness to speak our faith to those that are needing salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me begin today by talking a little bit about intimidation. Um, intimidation really is an attempt to encourage or discourage an action by inducing fear in an individual. That's what intimidation is. It's trying to stop something or trying to um, um, or encourage people to do something by inducing them or causing them to be fearful. And um, it really, when I think about this whole subject of intimidation, it's one that's really relevant in our culture today because we're living kind of like in a culture of intimidation uh, that's becoming more and more prevalent in politics and, and in life where you can hold um, convictions and you can hold uh, opinions about any given subject and it seems like culture is heading more and more in the direction where even if you do hold those appearance, opinions sincerely you're not given the liberty to express them. And if you do, you're immediately criticized for expressing your opinions. Now, I'll grant you that some opinions certainly need to be criticized, and maybe even as they are spoken, but, but intimidation doesn't just, doesn't look to enter into a dialogue of ideas or discussions. Intimidation really intends to silence. In, and to and to enforce the orthodoxy of the day. Now, today there's many subjects in our culture that can't be talked about: abortion, gay rights, fluid and non-binary gender identity. These are subjects that are like that you cannot uh, discuss. They're off limits. Um, People whose convictions are contrary to what popular culture is pushing today are oftentimes subjected to intimidation. In other words, this is what we believe to be true, 
and because they believe it to be true, even though it goes against, um, it goes against what nature teaches, or it goes against what it, what has been practiced in every culture at all times. Like for example, the redefinition of marriage, when it goes against all of those things. When you talk about these um, matters, um, there is. Attempts are made, just the silence, through intimidation, whoever is articulating these, these, um, these Bible-based or truth-based um, ideas. I, I remember not long ago being at, a, um, at a, one of the major um, uh, stores, and I saw a little girl with a, um, um, a T-shirt, and on the T-shirt it said, Simply, love is love. And I thought, okay, well, that makes sense. I wasn't aware of the implications of the statement, and maybe they weren't either, I don't know, but but the the statement, love is love, is really not, not true. It sounds great, but it's not true. It's being pushed in culture and society today. Love is love. It doesn't matter if, you, if, if a man loves a woman, if a man loves another man, if... Well, the 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 um, the possibilities are almost endless. Love is love, but that that's not true, is it? The Bible says that God is love, and because God is love, then He gets to define what love is and how we express love to one another. And when we've gone beyond the bounds of what He defines as true loving relationships, and so that I I. I, I I was impressed after I thought about it with the, the error of that statement. And yet, these are the kinds of statements and ideas that are running rampant in society. And you really can't argue against them. You can, but there is this pressure put on people just to be silent, just not to speak against the orthodoxy of the day, because then you'll get criticized and you'll get belittled or you'll get labeled as an ignorant person that really doesn't know or as a, um, a fundamentalist or whatever it is. There's, there's this intimidation factor that is going on in culture and in society today and it really is something that, um, that uh, we, we need to talk about. So I wanted to talk about that today. Now, let me... Let me, as I begin the study today, talk about an article that was written by Zach Stanton, in, um, he, who is the deputy editor of Political um, uh, Playbook. And um, in an article that is entitled, How Culture Wars Could Break Democracy, he says this, Culture wars always precede shooting wars. They don't necessarily lead to a shooting war, but you never have a shooting war without a culture war prior to it because culture provides the justifications for violence. Now that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because a cultural war, which is what we're involved in today, which is what our culture is involved in today, traditional values against all of these new ideas that are being propagated by, by, um, by, by individuals in our colleges and universities and even in culture at large. Um, the, it's interesting to note what Zach says, that culture wars always precede shooting wars. In other words, when, when, when a society is involved in a cultural war, it doesn't have to lead there, but there is going to be growing levels of intimidation if you don't succumb to the ideas that are being pushed by society or in culture. And that's exactly what, I say all of this because that's exactly what was happening to the flourishing church in, the, in, in Jerusalem as described in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter, chapter 4. There were the church was growing, the gospel was advancing, the miracle of the layman had proven 
the risen Christ and it was something that could not be denied. And it was, it was, um, it was speaking about the effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in light of the miracle that had taken place and the advance of the gospel, the, um, the Jewish leaders were very concerned and um, because of what this miracle might mean and this advance of the gospel that was taking place. And so what we learn in the story today and what we're going to read today is that that growing concern turned into attempts to intimidate the apostles and the church to stop preaching and teaching what they believed and what they knew to be true. Now that's happening in a culture today, everywhere. The intimidation factor, it may or may not lead to violence. That is yet in our culture to be determined. But, but um, what we do know is that the intimidation that is going on in our world today in every form of media, in politics, in, in the educational system, that increasing intimidation is with the intent to get Christians and others that have share our values to be quiet and not to speak and just to fold our hands and, and to allow them to train culture, direct culture and society yeah, according to their values. And of course, that's something that's unacceptable to us as Christians. So again, let's, let's read. Let's read the, the story in Acts chapter 4. And I want to invite you to go with me to Acts 4, 1 and 2. And here's what it says. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. In other words, they're sitting there preaching and teaching the people, speaking to the people about the miracle and the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's described in Acts chapter 3. As that's happening, the uh, leaders that were in control, the Sadducees were the ones that were in control of the temple, they came upon them. And uh, verse 2 tells us why. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now that's exactly the leaders are very, very concerned. They're concerned because of this miracle that has taken place and they cannot deny. And they're concerned because the apostles are preaching and teaching a resurrected Christ. This miracle took place because Jesus Christ is not in the tomb. In fact, he is alive. The gospel was advancing. Look at Acts chapter 4 verse 4. It says this, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So that's interesting, isn't it? The gospel is growing. You know, men, about 5,000 men are added to the, um, to the role of the church, and, um, and the Jewish leaders grow tremendously concerned. And so in Acts chapter 3, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 3, rather, what we find is how these leaders respond. Again, and they laid hands on them and put them on hold. In other words, put them away somewhere in prison, just put them on hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. So it was getting on to the evening time. They took a hold of them and they put them into jail. Now look at verses 6 and verse 7 of the same chapter. And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, this is the following day, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So they're really concerned, right? And so they get them out of prison the next day. They set them before all of these authorities that were the spiritual authorities of the, of, the, of the city of Jerusalem and of the nation of Israel, set them before them and they asked them, who gave you the authority to do this? By what authority did, did this man get raised up? And so how did the apostles respond to this act of intimidation, to this inquiry that was really uh, set up in such a way that it was to cause 
supposed to cause the apostles to be intimidated and, and just to cower and to back down. You say, why do you say that, Pastor? Because imagine this. It isn't just, it isn't just the high priest, Annas. It's Annas and Caiaphas that would eventually, as I understand it, become the high priest and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest. So there's a, there's a, a, a large group of, of spiritual authorities that are in front that 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 are before these these um, these two apostles, and the intent, of course, of this whole scenario is to intimidate them. And they ask them, well, you know, what is the authority and the power that you're using to do this? And so, what does Peter do? How does Peter respond to the to the question and to this attempt to intimidate them? Well, he's not intimidated at all. Look at verse number eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him hath this man, did this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. So they, do they take a step back? Do they get intimidated by this, by this scene in front of them of all these uh, uh, you know, a, a significant, powerful man, spiritual man? And the answer is absolutely not. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. So what he's going to do is he's going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. or tell them, hey, listen, um, this Jesus whom you folks crucified and God raised from the dead, um, this man who is alive is the one that raised this man from his impotence. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because, because they don't they don't cower at the at the um, at the, uh, the the situation in the situation that they've been put in. Rather, they speak with tremendous boldness. But I think that it's important for us to uh, to understand here that that Peter and John must have understood that this act of intimidation was not just going to affect them, but at some point it was going to spill over into the entire church. And that the if they allowed themselves to be intimidated, of course, they were not, because the first thing verse 8 says is, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them. And of course, the Holy Spirit is, is playing a primary role in the response that the apostles have in this situation. But listen again to what I said. How did the church respond to the intimidation? They responded with preaching and preaching boldly the message. They're not backing down at all. Um, in fact, um, when they speak, here's what they're saying, that you crucified Jesus Christ. You rejected the stone. And he's talking to spiritual authorities. You guys should have known better. That, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't have gotten the Messiah who the scripture speaks of and, and, and took him to a cross. But that's exactly what you did. You rejected the stone and now God has made it the primary stone, the cornerstone of the building. And then he ends his message, of course, by saying, and, and there is salvation in no other. Because there is no other name that's been given uh, to men under heaven whereby we must be saved. And so the name of Jesus Christ whom they had belittled and put down is now been exalted by God to the highest position of any name that men have ever had. It is in the name of Jesus then that that salvation now is being imparted or healing in this case, in the case of this man. Now look at verse number 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, 
they could say nothing against it. The message was certified. The message was confirmed through the healing of that, of that lame man. Isn't that interesting? How God uses signs and wonders. It's to quiet the voice of the intimidators. Now, as I've said in, in past studies, that there's a group of individuals that say that, that uh, miracles ceased when the apost last apostle died and the scriptures were written. That's a mistake. The gospel is confirmed through the working of miracles and signs and wonders, which is exactly what happened here. Now, after that, they're unable to say anything because the layman is there standing with a smile on his face, joyous because God has healed him. And the apostles are speaking with great boldness about the authority through, that they had. How did they get that authority to raise this man from that situation in which he found himself in? Uh, they speak with great boldness. Now, what happens in these leaders is that their level of fear or concern begins to grow. The council becomes fearful. But when they had, verse 15, commanded them to go aside out of the council, so they asked the apostles and the formerly lame men to leave the, uh, the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them, is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They had denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But now here was a miracle that they could not deny. Everyone had seen it with their own eyes. The lame man, formerly lame man, was there for them to behold. Now verse 17 says what they finally decide to do, but that it spread no further among the people. That's their concern. We've got to stop the message. We've got to stop Peter and John and the apostles and the Christians from talking about this message. We've got to stop them from speaking. To stop them, spread no further amongst the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. And they shall be called, and then... And, then, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus Christ. That's happening over and over in our culture. It really is. Students that believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, aggressive professors, um, atheistic professors, uh, young people that are getting caught up, being away from home perhaps for the first time, after having come up with all the indoctrination they have in high school and college and everything else, um, uh, tending towards these liberal ideas. And there sits a Christian, a believer in the resurrection of Christ, and the factor that they try to use to silence him is intimidation. Isn't that something? How intimidation works in the hearts of these people. Well, what did the disciples do? The disciples, first of all, preach, but again, let me say this. Look at verse number 23, because I'm going to end the study in a few moments. And being let go, finally they intimidated and let them go. They went, their own, they went to their own company, to the group of brothers, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and then they prayed. So the apostles came to a group of Christians that were gathered together and they told them, these men have threatened us. They told us we cannot speak in the name of Jesus. These aren't just any men. These are the spiritual authorities of the nation of Israel. And they threatened us that we can no longer speak. So what did they do? They prayed. They perceived a threat to the expansion of the gospel. Now, obviously the apostles were bold. The apostles weren't backing down, but there was a perceived threat to the advancement of the gospel. Because the devil doesn't just try to intimidate preachers, brothers. He tries to intimidate lay members. He tries to intimidate 
the 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 the, the common in a believer. If if the preachers will be silenced, then the message can will be eventually silenced. But if the preachers continue to preach the truth, but the membership is silenced, then the result essentially is the same. And so they perceived that threat. And how did they address the threat? The greater threat of the church being intimidated and being silenced by those religious leaders. Well, the Bible says that they lifted up their voice to God. And of course, in, in, um, in, in these verses, verse number 25 all the way down to verse number 30 the bible says um, uh, you know writes the prayer or, or, or rather uh, lets us know of the prayer that they prayed and it's a very biblical prayer now look at verse 31 and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were filled with the holy ghost and spake the word of god with boldness and so the answer again to to, um, to the threats is speaking the truth. Peter preached. And the answer to the intimidation of, of culture or of people is prayer for boldness. Now, I don't know where you find yourself. You may find yourself in a place where you've been intimidated and you're quiet. You don't speak much about your faith. You don't talk to others about the Lord Jesus Christ. You keep it as a private matter. Well, our faith was never meant to be just a private matter. It was meant for us to preach and to let other people know about it. So if you're lacking in boldness, brother, I want to ask you to pray and then to speak. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to back you up. They not only prayed, it's interesting to me, for boldness, but they prayed for, for boldness and for a movement of God in miracles, signs, and wonders. In other words, we need you to back up our preaching. And he did. The rest of the book of Acts shows, shows us the wonders and the signs that God did. We need boldness, folks. We need to be willing to undertake things that involve risk, preaching the word of God, that involves risk or danger, that's what we need to do. Put ourselves out there. Don't get intimidated by culture. Don't get intimidated by the things that the world is trying to do to get us to stop talking about Jesus. You know what the opposite of boldness is? It's fearfulness. The devil would love a church that is cowering, a church that is fearful to speak the truth. No, we won't do it. We refuse to do it. We are going to be a people that speak the truth of God. Now let me end by quoting again Zach Stanton when he says this, culture wars always precede shooting wars. And in the matter of the gospel of Jesus Christ, yeah, whenever the world cannot stop us from speaking about Jesus Christ through intimidation, it's going to go to violence at some point. In fact, we received a message last um, last um, a week or a week or two ago about um, what's going on in Afghanistan. Now that America have withdrawn its troops and 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 everything else, and uh, essentially what's happening from the reports that we've gotten is that the Taliban is coming in, and it's trying to exterminate absolutely the church in Afghanistan. They're going to homes of Christians, taking them out and killing them, and trying to exterminate Christianity in Afghanistan. Well, is it going to be? It is not, because the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to advance. But the point is this, that if I can't persuade you with my words, somewhere down the line, I'll try to persuade you and intimidate you with my violence. And we need to pray, folks. We need to pray like the apostles and the Christians pray. God, give us boldness. And the great thing about this text is that it ends saying this, and they spake the word of God with boldness. 
no fear, no intimidation. We're going to risk if it's necessary. We're going to expose ourselves to danger if it's necessary because we so value Christ and the gospel that he has given to us. Let's pray. Father, I pray as we have studied the word of God today that you would help us so that we would grow bold in our faith, so that we would not allow the enemy to intimidate us at all, Lord. Let the word of God be strong in our hearts and in our minds, and let us be bold in proclaiming the truth that we know, that Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of the world, died for the sins of many, and then rose from the dead so that we would have hope and life. Pray that you would bless those that are listening to this program. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you and thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.